Uh, the overall evolutionary track of a low mass star looks like this. So we're moving away from the main sequence. And then there are a couple little jogs in the evolutionary track. And then finally a large arc down to its final fate as a white dwarf and planetary nebula. And so this, this track, the, the jogs that happen here are due to differences in the fuel that's available inside the star and then where that fuel is available. So our goal for today is to understand why um, the star first increases in luminosity and then goes back down and up again um, as it pertains to the structure and composition of the interior of the star. So first, I just want to give all of these different pieces of the evolutionary track a name so we can keep track of them. Uh, your textbook doesn't go into this in very much detail, but I think it's nice to uh, be able to tie those physical processes together to the track. So we're going to spend a bit of time on it. All right, so the first piece of this track is called the subgiant branch. And during this part of the branch, the motion on the HR diagram is mostly horizontal. The star is getting cooler and just a little bit more bright. The next segment is called the red giant branch. And now the motion is mostly vertical. So the star is getting a little bit cooler, but mostly it's in increasing in luminosity. Um, after this, there's something called the helium flash and the luminosity goes down as the temperature rises. And then finally, the star spends a little bit of time uh, in what's called the horizontal branch. So this is like almost a second life, not quite on the main sequence, but it burns stably here. But eventually it will evolve away from this position again in sort of a similar motion as it took on the red giant branch. So we call this the asymptotic giant branch. And then this last large curve represents the star's appearance and um, temperature uh, in its planetary nebula phase. Not pictured here is the white dwarf, which would be down here on the lower left-hand side of the diagram. We'll talk about those next week. All right, so this is the overall process. And what I'm gonna do now is go through these step-by-step step and talk about what's happening inside the star for each of these branches. Okay, so the um, subgiant branch is horizontal on the diagram. So the luminosity is almost constant, but the temperature is dropping quickly. So based on those two pieces of information, what must be happening to the size of the star? Okay, but yes, it is also a very valid point that the star has to become larger if it maintains the same luminosity, even though the temperature is going down. All right, so the size of the star is increasing on the subgiant branch. And um, to understand what's going on, let's look inside the star. So we talked about this a little bit last time uh, that the core uh, uh, runs out of fuel and that's what kicks off the entire process of stellar evolution. So just to recap that idea, um, hydrogen is busy converting helium into the core when the star is in hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning that the pressure and the gravity are in balance. And this is the situation anytime that the star is on the main sequence. But more and more helium is building up in the core. And eventually, there's too much helium in the core, and it no longer has sufficient amounts of hydrogen fuel to maintain its rate of fusion. So as a result, the fusion slows down. The pressure from the core gets smaller. And so then gravity is greater than the force of the pressure and shrinks that core. Now, as the core contracts, it's going to heat up and the heat ignites a shell of helium that surrounds the core. And now there's you know, fusion happening in this layer and that is generating heat that pushes out on the outer layers of the star. So now pressure is building from that helium shell and this uh, expands the envelope. So uh, the entire envelope of the star gets larger and this is what is causing the radius to increase all right, and so the reason that the surface cools is that the um, energy is going into the expansion of the stellar envelope instead of going into heating up the star or even maintaining its temperature. So the situation that we're in now is that the surface of the star is expanding and cooling, but what is happening inside the core? Okay, I'm seeing most votes for D. The core is shrinking and heating, and that's exactly right. So 
um, it might seem a little bit counterintuitive that both of these things can be happening in the star at one time. But if we think back to the idea that it's our helium shell that our, our hydrogen shell that is creating this new um, energy, then we can see, okay, it's pushing out on the surface to expand and cool the surface, but it's also pushing in on the core. So that pressure is directed in both directions. So the pressure on the core causes it to continue shrinking and heating. So the star is sort of doing these two processes that are totally opposite, but in different regions. All right, so shrinking and heating core, but expanding and cooling surface during our subgiant branch. All right, so we can look at the subgiant branch for lots of different stars on the main sequence. And the main difference between them is that the, the length that a star's subgiant branch is, de it depends on the mass. So for example, a um, solar mass star would have a short subgiant branch. So it would spend not too much time here before it enters the giant phase. Lower mass stars don't even have a subgiant branch at all. They just start to go up the red giant branch right away. And then more massive stars spend more time in the subgiant branch before they start to red giant. All right, so these evolutionary tracks, the ones that I'm gonna show you for the rest of this class are for something similar in mass to the sun. And in general, um, I've been talking about low mass stars, but I never defined what is a low mass star. It's anything that's about two sun masses or lower. Okay. So our next step in stellar evolution is to ascend the red giant branch. And here we're moving mostly vertically on the HR diagram, which means our temperature is mostly constant, uh, but the luminosity is increasing. So again, I want to know what is happening to the size of the star during the red giant branch. All right, it's probably a lot more clear here. Everyone's answering A, the size of the star is increasing. Um, we can clearly see that it starts somewhere around 10 solar radii and goes all the way up to 100. So yes, of course, the star is now expanding. Um, and this has to be happening because if it's at the same temperature, but the luminosity is increasing, the only other thing that could change that luminosity is the size of the star. Okay, um, I think it's important to point out that there's nothing sort of magic about the size of the star that impacts the luminosity, but instead it's the fusion rate that determines the luminosity, which in turn impacts the size of the star. So that relationship, um, luminosity is proportional to temperature to the fourth times the radius squared um, that is completely valid as a descriptive um, equation, but it's not the kind of root cause of what's going on. Changes in the fusion rate in the star, that's the root cause of changes in luminosity. Okay, so we're increasing our size in the red giant branch now. So what's happening inside the star at this point? Um, so essentially now the, the surface has cooled enough in its subgiant phase that it starts to become opaque to radiation. And so instead of continuing to expand, it starts to absorb photons. And so that trapped light is um, stopping the, the temperature drop at the surface and the star just continues to, to grow. So the other thing that's happening in the red giant branch is that the, um, so the luminosity is increasing because the fusion rate is increasing. Okay. And this is because the helium core continues to gain mass, but it's shrinking and shrinking. So uh, gravity is pressing in on that core ever more tightly. And the more dense the core is, the, the faster things can burn. So the higher temperature of the helium core is creating higher temperatures in the hydrogen shell, and that is burning faster and faster. Okay, so um, this process just keeps going and going until the star reaches the sort of top of its red giant branch and sort of hits a catastrophe, which is called the helium flash. So at the very top of the red giant branch, uh, we reach a period where all of the helium in the core rapidly begins fusing. Um, this happens in a period of 10 to the five years compared to the 10 to the 10 year lifespan that it spends on the main sequence. So this is a flash in the pan for our star. Uh, the core temperature here is hot enough for helium at this point to fuse. So before this helium fusion was not possible, 
only hydrogen fusion was possible because the star was not yet hot enough for helium fusion. But as the um, temperature increases enough uh, in the core, then the core can fuse helium. So another important point I wanted to mention here, the temperature that we're reading here on the HR diagram is the temperature of the surface of the star. It does not tell you what the temperature is in the core. So that's why I, I want to draw the distinction between the surface and the core are doing different things. And it's the behavior of the core that's driving the evolution, um, at least of the luminosity. OK. So this helium fusion process is also called the triple alpha process because helium nuclei are called alpha particles. This just came from the uh, radioactive um, research. So this is what the triple alpha process looks like. There's three helium-4 nuclei coming in and fusing. All right, so in this triple alpha process, if we have three helium-4 nuclei coming in, then what could this generate? All right, I guess I have no reason for you to remember exactly how massive each of these nuclei is. So I will tell you, um, carbon nuclei are, um, they have 12 nucleons in them. Hydrogen has two nucleons, one proton, one neutron. Uh, magnesium, I actually don't remember, but it's more than carbon. Uh, nitrogen has 14 and oxygen has 12. So if we just count up all the nucleons that are going in, um, four times three is uh, 12, oh sorry, carbon is 12, oxygen is 16. So we are generating carbon from our triple alpha process. All right, um, later in today's activity, you'll actually look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, some things that can happen with carbon fusion. And so what you need to know for that is that the fusion process always conserves nucleons unless they convert into something else. So sometimes, for example, a proton can decay into a neutron plus a positron. So you looked at this a little bit when we talked about fusion in the sun. Um, and that's the, the key thing that you need to know today is that the number of nucleons has to stay the same in the fusion process unless there's one that's ejected from the reaction. Okay. Um, the other thing that you should know is that the charge, the electric charge stays the same here. So for example, if I look at, if blue is my protons, for example, then I have one, two, three, four, five, six protons of helium coming in. So the net charge here is plus six and the net charge of the carbon is also plus six. So the triple alpha process doesn't just take three heliums, smash them together and produce a carbon. It's actually a multi-step process. Um, the first step is that two heliums come together to form an atom of beryllium or I guess I should say a nucleus of beryllium. So now there are four protons and four neutrons in that nucleus. And then the second step is that our third helium um, particle comes in and that is now adding eight nucleons of beryllium to four nucleons in the helium. And that produces the 12 total in the carbon, six protons and six neutrons. Um, atoms are usually made of uh, an, an equal number of protons and neutrons, but it's possible for the neutron number to be different by one or two, sometimes more. Um, but it's the proton number that determines the identity of that atom. So six protons for carbon, seven for nitrogen, eight for oxygen. Okay, so um, during this process where helium starts to fuse, the helium flash, um, what is happening now to the total energy output of the star? So thinking about this purple track. All right, so I'm seeing the most votes for B that the total energy output of the star is decreasing. And the total energy output is the luminosity. So if we're going down on the luminosity axis, then we must be decreasing total energy output. So that is what's happening here. This track is going down in luminosity and up in temperature. Um, and so this might seem a little bit weird because the, what I told you about the helium flash is that a lot of the helium in the core starts to get burned all at once. 
So it seems like that would increase the total energy output. But again, we have to look inside the star and see what's happening at the core to really understand what's going on. And so what's happening here is that the total energy output is decreasing because the energy that's used up in the helium flash is going into expanding the core and that is cooling the core on the, ins the inside of the star. And since the luminosity depends on the core temperature, the, the core temperature controls the rate of fusion, then that actually decreases the total energy output for the star. So it seems weird, but that's, that's what's happening. The interior of the star, uh, the core is now expanding and cooling, just like the exterior was during our subgiant phase. All right. So after our helium flash, we reach the horizontal branch. And now our star lives here for another 50 million years. And it basically just burns helium using the triple alpha process during that time. So the star has plenty of helium fuel in its core. And so after the flash uses up lots of it, um, it still has enough to continue burning for a while. But that fuel runs out too and builds up carbon ash. The result of our triple alpha process was carbon. And so um, carbon ash building up will kick off another phase of evolution. Remember it was the uh, hydrogen converting to helium that build up kicked off our initial evolution. So what happened, which one of these describes the best choice for what ultimately happened when our star ran out of hydrogen to burn in its core? So this is what kicked off the initial evolution. What was the consequence? Okay, um, I see about half of the votes for D, hydrogen shell burning, which is the correct answer. So we, we remember started to burn a shell of hydrogen just outside of the core after the helium, uh, I'm sorry, after the hydrogen in the core was depleted and replaced with helium, the star couldn't burn the helium yet, so that we haven't reached the helium flash yet. Uh, but instead, before that, the hydrogen shell ignited. So um, a white dwarf will eventually form, and this is what happens next for the, the lowest mass stars. So they skip this phase of hydrogen shell burning. But for stars that are about similar to our sun, they go through this hydrogen shell burning phase. And this helium flash again happens later. So that's after the hydrogen shell ignites because the only way to start to burn helium is to increase the temperature in the core. And so that only happens after this hydrogen shell has spent some time burning and uh, heating the core from the outside and then pushing out on the envelope from the inside. All right, so coming back to, you know, skipping back down to after our horizontal branch phase, remember we're building up now carbon instead of building up helium. So our carbon ash is building up in the core. Um, again, the, the star is too cool to start fusing carbon. And so as a result, it kicks off helium and hydrogen shell burning. So just outside the carbon core is the, the hottest part of the star. Uh, and that's where helium will burn in a shell. And then just outside the helium shell is hot enough for hydrogen to fuse. So there's a hydrogen shell burning and then outside of that, there is hydrogen in the envelope of the star, but that part of it is still too cool to fuse. So some of the fuel is never used. It's just happily living its hydrogen life in the exterior layers of the star. All right, so this shell burning phase, when it happened to our subgiant star, this is what kicked off our expansion uh, of the exterior. So it puffed up the outside of the star. And so the helium and hydrogen shell burning are gonna do the same thing. They're gonna puff up the outside of the star. So this is the asymptotic giant branch that the star now begins to climb. It's an increase in luminosity, decrease in temperature and increase in size, just similar to the red giant branch. And it's here now that a lot of interesting things start to happen in the interior of the star um, because carbon can interact with other particles to produce a lot of different types of elements. So this is how our star makes a lot of the elements we're familiar with like carbon, or sorry, nitrogen and oxygen. All right. So I wanna summarize this in kind of a flow chart and I'll 
share with you the final flow chart at the end. Um, so if we begin with our protostar, um, if our star is more than 0 0.08 solar masses, then it will successfully become a real star um, and burn hydrogen in uh, the main sequence. If it's less than 0 0.08 solar masses, then that star won't be enough to actually form a real star. It'll become a brown dwarf. It will never achieve fusion. All right, so after our star spends lots of time on the main sequence burning hydrogen, if it is too small, then it will not have a um, helium flash. It will simply become a helium white dwarf star. But if it is more uh, massive enough, then it will have a helium flash and then eventually go into helium burning. So this is kind of what happens based on the mass of the star. So lots of different products out there uh, depending on the initial mass.